Major Cat, backyard explorer extraordinaire. Tally ho! Tally ho! Hi, everybody. I'm Ava. I'm a youth camp counselor and program volunteer here at Five Rivers Metro Parks. Welcome to Nature Cat Camp, where we virtually explore our local parks and challenge you to explore the nature right outside your window. We have a fun day at camp planned for you, so let's get started. Are you ready? Everybody say, tally ho! If you are wild about animals, you are going to really like today's camp as we explore wildlife in motion. Today is Animal Ambassador Day here at Nature Camp. We are going to meet some of the animals that live right in our forests, learn about ways they communicate, and get to see many of them right up close. Just because we call something wildlife doesn't necessarily mean it lives in the wild. While it's true that towns and cities have less nature, you can still find all kinds of animals in the urban environments. Today we're going to spend most of the time exploring animals in the forest, but here is some of the wildlife that likes living in the city too. So just like people, wild animals sometimes choose to live in the city. As long as they can find food, water, and shelter, they are happy to call it home. But other animals choose to live in forests. Five Rivers Metro Parks is home to lots and lots of wild animals. Let's visit now with Haley and Mary Beth for an up-close look at wild animals that call these forests home. Thanks, Ava. I just love coming outside here at the Twin Valley Welcome Center and exploring. There's so many wild animals that live outside here. And Hallie and Mary Beth and I, we also really love this place because there are some wild animals that live inside our building and we take care of them. They help us. They are wild animal ambassadors and they teach about how people can take care of wild animals here in the parks, but also right where you're living. So today we're going to be showing you a little bit about how we take care of them and what makes them so special to us. Hallie, can you go get a long scaly friend that has super cool abilities and we'll go talk to our friends here at the boardwalk with. I'm here with my long scaly friend, JJ. He's a gray rat snake and he's about eight years old and six feet long. That's longer than I am tall. Can you believe that we have some things in common with JJ? He's got eyes, just like we do, that he uses to see. He's got a nose that he uses to breathe, but he actually uses something else to smell. He uses his tongue. So when JJ sticks his tongue out, he's using it to smell. And it has two different points, which means he can smell in two different directions at the same time. This helps him find his food and prey, and he can decide which way to go with which way he smells his food. Something else we have in common is that we both have skin, but since JJ is a reptile, he has scales that cover his entire body. And when he gets bigger, his scales get really tight and he needs to crawl out of them. So he might find a rock and rub his nose on the rock until it splits and he'll crawl all the way out of his old scales. And underneath will be brand new shiny scales. Something that's different about JJ and us is that JJ's a reptile, so he's cold-blooded. We as humans are warm-blooded, which means that no matter what's going on outside, our blood stays warm but JJ needs outside sources to keep himself warm. So you can see him wrapping around my arm and he's using my body heat to keep himself warm. Out in the wild, they might sunbathe on a warm rock or he could use his heat lamps in his enclosure. So next time you're out hiking with your family, maybe keep an eye out for some of these beautiful creatures hanging out on a rock or maybe hanging out of a tree, but make sure to give them space and just use your eyes to look. Now let's see what friends Mary Beth has for us to meet. It's going to be totally awesome. Today we 
brought out our box turtles. They are getting some sunshine because just like you and I, turtles need vitamin D and being outside and playing in the sunshine helps them to get them. Why don't you let me introduce you to them? This is CJ. He's about 25 years old. This one is Myrtle and she's about 30 years old. And this one is Terry, and she's about 16 years old. Most box turtles can live up to be about 70 years in captivity. You're probably wondering how I know that Terry is about 17 years old. Well, at the Welcome Center, we keep very good records that help us know the age of the animals that we're working with. But how would I know how old a turtle was in the wild? Well, if you look very close, Naturalists will get down on the ground and try to look at these scoots. These are types of scales that turtles have on their shell. And on these scoots are lines, and each line represents a year in the life of this turtle. And as turtles get older, those lines kind of wear down, so it makes it more difficult for us to tell the age of the turtle, but it gives us a really good idea. Now, I was calling them a he or a she, and you're probably wondering how I know whether or not they're a boy or a girl. Well, if you look at CJ, he has bright red eyes. And all male box turtles in this area have bright red eyes. If he were a female, his eyes would be a dark brown or maroon color. So I'm gonna pick him up to show you his underbelly. If you look, CJ, has a big dent in the bottom of his shell. If he were a female, his shell would be flat on the bottom. Speaking of turtles, Adventure Central has some very colorful turtles to show you. Let's go check in with them and see who they have. Thanks, Mary Beth. I'm Crystal, and I'm here with our painted turtles, Donatella and Fancy. They have a nice habitat here and in our center and they love sunbathing. They eat turtle pellets, worms, small fish, and greens. And as you can see, we feed them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but they swim here in our aquarium. And this is where the kids like to watch them swim as well as they observe their colors. We also have a box turtle. His name is Michelangelo. Hi, Mike, how are you doing? He likes strawberries and tomatoes from our garden, and he also likes to walk in the woods. So what do you think, Mike? Would you like to take a walk today? Awesome, let's join him for a walk. I think it would be a great idea to put this GoPro on Michelangelo, and then that way we can see the forest the way that he does. Let's go. Wow, Michelangelo, it was really cool to see the forest through your eyes. Our friends at Twin Valley Welcome Center have another animal they want to show us. Back to you guys. Thanks guys. Those are some really cool turtles. For this next wild animal ambassador, we need some special tools like a good glove and a leash. Now this is Ruby and she's been with us since 1999. So she's at least 25 years old. And in Ohio, if I see a big bird that has a wonderful belly band in the front and then look at her beautiful tail feathers, I know it's a red-tailed hawk. Hey, Ruby. Let's uh, go talk to our friends now. You want to step up? 
There we go. There we go. These are called Jesses on her feet. And we just put a little leash on those just in case she would happen to get away from us outside. We could pick her right back up and keep her safe. Now, when people see Ruby, they often ask me, why are you holding this wild bird inside of a cage? And why do you keep her on a leash? And that's because when she first came, she was injured. And you can see from her wing that one is a little shorter. So if we let her go, she would not be able to get her own food. And then she would get really, really hungry and she would just starve and die. So we asked the government if we could have her here to help us teach. And they said yes. We had to ask the federal government and the state of Ohio, both. Now, they want us to help people understand that birds like this hawk, when they fly out and eat like a snake, or they might eat a rabbit or squirrel, or they eat a lot of mice, that that's not because they're bad. That's just the kind of bird they are, and that's what they eat for food. So it's okay that they are out there hunting, and it actually helps some of the other animals when they do eat them uh, because it keeps their population in balance. Now, one thing we do need to remember about Ruby is that she is not a pet. Um, she is a wild animal still, and we need to keep a very good respect with her. So we're just going to set her back down here. Ruby and all of our other wild animal ambassadors really help Five Rivers Metro Parks deliver a key message to the public. You see, we take care of 16,000 acres of land. Almost all of it, 90% is managed in natural states. So it's beautiful woodlands, riparian zones along the rivers, prairies, wetlands. And in that land, a lot of wild animals and plants live. And that's great, but it isn't enough land because animals don't stay in parks. They have wings, some of them go on long journeys. And so if you can do things around your home, maybe plant oak trees or other native plants for wildlife, when they leave parks and natural areas, they have a place they can still get their food and their shelter and their water. And that way they'll be nice and healthy and they can come back to the parks and they also are close to you. Now, if you see a wild animal in our park, maybe there's a snake on the ground or a turtle, we do ask that you be respectful to them. It would be great if you could watch them it's not very nice to throw a stick or a rock at them. So just let them be and watch them. But if you pick up an animal, just like Ruby sometimes picks up a mouse in order to eat it, that animal might think you're trying to hurt it. And so if you try to pick up a snake, it might bite you. Not because it's mean, but because it's scared. So just give them a little extra room. Don't try to pick them up. Enjoy them. And then you can uh, know that there's lots of good places around you where animals are having wonderful lives. Now, since Ruby lives here with us, she can't hunt by herself. We brought her her dinner. Thank you so much, Ruby. You're such a beautiful bird. We hope you live a long life with us and continue your good work. And we're going to go back here behind the Twin Valley Welcome Center now. And Hallie and Mary Beth have some final thoughts they want to share with you. So, we'll see you around. Not only do we keep track of how old our animals are, we also keep track of how much they weigh and what they eat. What did CJ have to eat today? CJ ate one nightcrawler. One nightcrawler. Nightcrawlers are really good for box turtles. How much did he weigh? 16 ounces. 16 ounces, that's a whole pound. All right, I know we fed our red-tailed hawk today. Let's find her. How much did she get today? She got four mice. Four mice. All right, we didn't weigh her, so we are finished. After a 
long day of animal care, I like to get outside, explore, relax, and immerse myself in the habitats that these wild animals live in. Me too. Wow, it is really beautiful and peaceful out here. I'm so glad that we came out. We also learned a lot today. We learned that boy box turtles have bright red eyes and a dent in their belly, and that the painted turtles at Adventure Central have bright yellow lines on their face. We also learned that snakes are cold-blooded and that they have scales that come off. And we learned that sometimes animals need our help. And we're able to help our animal ambassadors, but I wonder how we could help animals out here in the wild. That's a great question. It's really lucky that they have all this land to have a home in. What are some ways that you help them keep their home here in the parks? Well, I know that when I'm going for a hike, I make sure to collect all my trash and throw it away. And also, if I see an animal out in the wild, I'll leave it where it is. But sometimes the animals don't stay in our parks. That's very true. But there are a lot of things that we can do in our own backyard that help them to have a home there. Things like planting a garden. There are so many types of gardens. You have fairy gardens, vegetable gardens, pollinator gardens, so many things that we can grow. We can also grow trees. Snakes like to climb trees. Sometimes they even sleep up there. That sounds really uncomfortable. I've thought of the best way that we can help our visitors help animals have a home in nature and in their own backyards. And that would be just to get outside and play. Because if we're outside playing, then we'll learn to love nature and want to help it when we grow up. You are so smart. And that's perfect because playing out in nature makes you smarter and healthier and happier. And who doesn't want to be that? Are you ready to head back in? <sighs> Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed meeting each and every one of our animal ambassadors. And remember that these animals aren't pets, but helpers, just like you. And they're asking for your help to have homes out in our parks and in your own backyard. I hope to see you out on the trails. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Haley and Mary Beth. That was awesome. Being up close with the wild animals is really interesting. Wouldn't it be cool if we could talk to animals? Well, we can't, but did you know that animals communicate with each other in many different ways? They use body language, sound, smell, touch, and even chemical and electrical communications. In fact, scientists say that animals are far superior to humans in many of their communication methods. Do you remember on another day at camp when we saw the way beavers built amazing structures like dams and lodges? Let's check in with Nature Cat and friends as they try to figure out if beavers and other woodland animals communicate. Look, those beavers are building a lodge. Whoa, very nice. But do they communicate? I'll find out. Hello, beavers. It's me, Hal. I'm on a very important case, and I was wondering... Okay, bye. Thank you. Good to see you. Stay in touch. Uh, well, the beavers do not communicate at all, so... They don't? Nope. They were worse than the ducks. Agent Hal, maybe beavers have their own way of communicating that's not like ours. But they didn't make any sounds at all whatsoever. Huh. Let's just keep observing, fellow agents. The beaver slept its tail, and the others dove underwater. Hey, guys! I have an idea about how the beavers communicate. Can I give it a go? Go forth, Agent Squeaks. Thank you. That fox just communicated. It talked. That was Agent Squeaks, Agent Hal. Oh, I see. like the beaver slapped its tail to warn the other beavers that an intruder is near. Amazing! So, do beavers communicate? Yes! Don't you see? The beavers communicate with their tails! Agent Squeaks, because of your awesome undercover work, 
I present you with the Golden Badge of Honor! <sighs> I'll never get the Golden Badge of Honor. Maybe I'm not cut out to be an agent of the great outdoors. Wait, Hal! Come on, you're a great agent, buddy! Don't quit on us now, Hal. Yeah, you'll win a badge someday, I'm sure of it. No, I won't. Just face it. I just don't understand this whole animal communication thing. Hi, Chipmunk. It's me, Hal. I guess you don't communicate like I do either, huh, Chipmunk? <laughs> hey, Woodchuck. It's me, Hal. Oh, yeah. You probably don't communicate like I do either, do you, Woodchuck? Oh, well. It doesn't matter. I'm not an agent of the great outdoors anymore anyway. Wait, why are you making that sound, Woodchuck? Hey! Hey, maybe it's making that sound because a hawk is nearby. Who's gonna hear him? Whoa! It looks like the chipmunk heard the woodchuck sound and now hid from the hawk! Whoa! I wonder if the chipmunk understands the woodchuck! Oh, I gotta tell the other agents! <laughs> Way to go, Hal. Perhaps one day we will be able to communicate with animals. Scientists today are working on technology that might allow us to actually talk with our pets and other animals. I wonder what they will say. You can write down your thoughts in your journal. What questions would you ask an animal, and what animal would you like to talk to? Did someone say more nature, Cat? Check this out. Holly ho who's ready to play? I said, who's ready to play? Hello? Anyone want to play? Anyone? Sorry, man, can't play now. Too busy watching our favorite rescue hero, baby. Race the rescue, rescue raccoon. raccoon! What ho! Look, it's a squirrel, and she's caught in netting. That's not good. But don't worry, it's Racer to the rescue! Remember, only an expert like me can do this. Now, it's important to be as quiet as possible. If I scare this squirrel, she might react and hurt herself even more. I just need to cut the netting. And good golly, hello, Dolly, the squirrel is free. The squirrel does not appear to be injured in any way, so she won't need my help at the animal center to get better. <laughs> there she goes, back to the wild where she belongs. Another successful rescue. Hooray! And remember, if you ever see a wild animal that needs help, call an expert like a grown-up or me, Eraser, the rescue raccoon. See you next time on Eraser the Rescue! Eraser the rescue raccoon was able to save that little squirrel, but sometimes things don't go as well. Sometimes wild animals get injured and require help. Fortunately, there are wildlife experts that work every day to help protect and rehabilitate animals. Here now is Coyote Peterson to give us a virtual tour of the Ohio Wildlife Center, one of Ohio's premier wildlife rescue and rehabilitation centers. Coyote will introduce us to a veterinary and rehabilitation specialist that treat injured wildlife, including a cute little squirrel even smaller than the one we just saw with Nature Cat. Let's go up close and see some of the heroes of Ohio's wildlife rescue. The Ohio Wildlife Center was founded in 1984 by Dr. Donald Burton, and today I'll be lucky enough to get a first-hand look at how this incredible establishment fosters awareness and appreciation of Ohio's native wildlife through rehabilitation, education, and wildlife health studies. Our first stop would be the Wildlife Hospital. This is where the journey begins for any animal that is in trouble. Well, we must be at the right place because there's no skunks inside the building. We're going to head downstairs and see the rehabilitation process of some of the wild animals that live here in Ohio. Come on, let's go inside and check it out. Pretty excited. <laughs> and help rehabilitate some animals today. Hi, I'm Dr. Melinda Marks and I'm the veterinarian for the Ohio Wildlife Center. Working alongside Dr. Melinda Marks, I was about to get up close with some animals that were recently admitted. 
Well, I'm the clinical veterinarian here at the Ohio Wildlife Center, and I take care of all of the injured, orphaned wildlife that come in and provide any veterinary services that they may need. So surgeries, x-rays, medications, anything that they need prior to release is my job. Great. What sort of stuff are we going to see today? We have quite a full hospital. We have some raptors today, some turtles, and uh, some baby squirrels for you to see. Ooh, everybody loves baby squirrels. We all know the turtles are my favorite. All right, well, let's head downstairs and uh, start taking care of these animals. It's official. Today I'm going to help rehabilitate some animals. I'm Christy Cromwell. I'm the hospital and pre-release facility director. So what's the first animal that we're going to look at today? Um, we're going to be looking at a raccoon that has a fractured jaw. So we actually have its mouth taped shut so that we're not injuring it any further. And then we have a feeding tube into it. So we're going to bring that raccoon out okay. and then we're going to feed it. Cool. Well, let's bring out the raccoon. With Christy carefully holding this little guy in place, I'm able to give him some delicious milk formula through a feeding tube. Am I going slow enough? You can go a little bit faster. Oh, actually. okay. I don't want it to like shoot out his nose. We all know how easy it is to make milk come out your nose. All right. He's ready to go to sleep now. He is. He's got a <laughs> belly full of milk and it's time for his nap. Not too grouchy now that he's had his food. So the tube that was connected to the end of the syringe, does that go all the way down into his stomach? It does. It's something called an e-tube. So if an animal has an injury where they're unable to eat like a jaw fracture, then we put a feeding tube in so that we can maintain their calorie requirements while they're healing. Hmm, very cool. Next, we would take a look at a red-shouldered hawk who's suffering from a broken wing. Yeah, you definitely have to be careful of the talon. So that's the bird's weapon. Yep. Dr. Marks checks to make sure everything is healing properly. Yeah, we definitely want to keep his head covered while, for the most part while we're doing the exam. And then comes my part. More feeding. Mmm, delicious. Hawk food. Only this time it's rat livers. Nothing is more appetizing to a hawk than fresh rat livers. Ooh, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. It's probably mm. ready for another. Putting cut up rodent liver down the throat of a red-shouldered hawk. That that's something you haven't done every day. And it's cool to feel the, the meat just kind of build up there in its crop, and it's neat how, you know, once you feel it's about the size of a golf ball, you know it's had enough to eat, and they'll slowly kind of digest that food. Last, but certainly not least, is probably the most adorable little critter you have ever seen. Holy cow, that is a tiny squirrel. Yeah. Put your camera over here and look at this. You didn't even have any fur yet. It's a baby eastern gray squirrel. Look at that little guy. He's so little, his eyes aren't even open. So how do you feed a baby squirrel? All right, so we feed our squirrels with a syringe and a, and a synthetic nipple on the end. Um, so this guy, what's Is, is that a synthetic weight? squirrel nipple? This is a s synthetic squirrel nipple. <laughs> so cool. you can use them for kittens and puppies too. So the squirrels are usually pretty good eaters. So they latch onto it and they take to it pretty well the first couple of times. This is not what I imagined when you said cute. This is like cute times 10. A little warm Pedialyte from an eyedropper and this future tree climber is ready for his nap. Rest well, little squirrel. If I could put you in my pocket and keep you forever, I totally would. But one day, you will return to the wild. So that's how you feed a baby squirrel with a synthetic squirrel nipple. Do you know something I'm realizing here at camp? There are really a lot of cool jobs in the park systems. Who knows, maybe one day you'll be working to help preserve nature and wildlife, right? No matter where you live, a great way to observe wildlife right outside your window is with a backyard birdhouse and bird feeder. Maya is back to show you how you can make your own using recycled items. Bird watching is a great outdoor activity, and by adding birdhouses or bird feeders outside your window, you're creating a safe and welcoming place for more birds to visit. Hi, I'm Maya. Today, we're making a birdhouse out of simple household items. Birdhouses come in all shapes and sizes, and today, we'll be making... Oops, <laughs> wrong picture. Your birdhouse will look a little more like this. Making a birdhouse is not just a fun activity, but also you're creating a healthy environment for the birds in your area. You will get to know the types of birds and you're providing a safe place for them to live. For this project, you will need an empty milk carton, some markers, some popsicle sticks, a pair of scissors, a hot glue gun, a push pin, some string, some colored construction paper, bird seed, and some other items you would like to use to decorate. You may need an adult's help with the scissors and hot glue. First, you want to make sure you dump out any milk that might be in the carton. We don't want to give our new friends a smelly old house. Ugh. Yuck. 
Once the carton is clean, cover the outside with construction paper and start decorating. Once you're done decorating, cut a 2x2 two two square or circle in the center of the carton using your scissors. Now, using your popsicle sticks, poke it under the opening of the milk carton. This will act as a perch so the birds can land on it. Also, use your glue to secure the popsicle stick in place. Poke a hole near the top of the carton and loop a string through it. We will use this so we can hang our birdhouse from a tree branch. Now our birdhouse is finished! Now, where to put it? The best place is near some branches, where birds like to sit, but also in plain sight, so you can watch it inside your house. Perfect! Now, add some bird seed to the bottom of the milk carton, and that completes our birdhouse! Sprinkling some bird seed on top of your fence or patio lets birds know that there is food in the area. Now to find some tenants. Okay, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Bye bye! Thanks, Maya. This is a great way to observe nature right outside our window, no matter where we live. You can find the instructions to make your own birdhouse or bird feeder on our website. Another way to observe nature up close is by camping in it. Have you ever been camping? Today's recreation adventure is going to give us an idea of what it's like. So let's go camping, campers! Oh, yeah, yeah, double enough, that's good. Hey, maybe you can practice camping in your yard or living room, but check with a grown-up first. It's fun to build tents that you make from blankets, and you can use your imagination to create a great wilderness adventure right there in your yard or living room. Don't forget to take your nature journal and binoculars on your journey. As you know, at the end of each day at camp, we take a virtual trip to some of the national parks found here in America. We can explore and observe with our pretend binoculars. All you have to do is move close enough to the screen so that when you're looking through your binoculars, you can't see anything but the screen. If you have not made your binoculars yet, you can use your hands like this. So let's explore, and we hope to see you again for more fun at Nature Camp. Bye!